Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Amanda Hickey. Amanda was previously a computer scientist whose passion for writing led her down a different path. She is now a published novelist and is the author of An Ordinary Epidemic, also known as Before This Is Over, which was recently re-released in paperback in the US. Join us as we talk about her novel, volunteering with First Robotics in Australia, and bookbinding. Thank you, Amanda, for joining me today on Steam Powered. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about you know, your writing and your very interesting life that we've briefly discussed about. Thank you for having me. So you had your beginnings in computer science. Uh, what drew you to the field to begin with? So that was back in the uh, early 80s, and uh, my dad had bought an Apple IIe that I remember that we used to play games on and he used to write stuff on and things like that. Um, and I remember trying to program it to a, um, a sprite on it. And I must have spent months working on this sprite, which was, <laughs> I remember, a Dalek. And I only ever managed to get it go, to go backwards. I never got it to go forward. <laughs> but it was, you know, there wasn't the internet. I didn't have manuals. So I guess that was my first experience of programming. Wow. So what, what made you want to do that to begin with is to... Uh, just to create or because you'd seen it before? It was a very new field at the time. And I thought that was probably a lot of exciting things happening in that field. And also it was kind of a mix of like art and logic that really appealed to me. That it was logical because, you know, the program did what you wanted it to, but there was also an art. Not all programmers were the same. So that, that appealed to me. That's what led you to enrolling into computer science. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was, I was kind of, I was one of those people who really didn't know which way I was going to go. It could have, like up until enrolment day, I could have either gone to English literature or computer science, but computer science won. So what was it like being in computer science and studying computer science back in the 80s? So um, I, was, I was in a class of 150 direct entry students at UNSW um, in 1983. And my memory is that there was at most... At absolute most, I think, 10 women in that uh, cohort. I might be wrong about that because I didn't know everybody. But certainly um, I kind of, uh, I sat with two of them and um, I'm not, re I, I'm vaguely aware of there being another couple, but there wasn't, there certainly wasn't, I wasn't looking around me and seeing women everywhere. I was seeing a sea of, of men. And of the three of us, I was actually the only one who finished a computer science degree and then I didn't oh. go on to use it. Um and I've had people ask me about why that might be. Um, and I don't, I genuinely don't know the answer to that, except that I think that it was in that period of time when computer science was very much becoming a boys club. And there was this concept of, you know, if you weren't pulling all nighters, you, you weren't a dedicated, um, you weren't a dedicated programmer, you weren't going to kind of make it. And, and that wasn't helped by the fact that we had two PDP 11s for our entire year. So our entire year ended up being about 100, <laughs> about 300. Uh, and so each of, half of us were um, allocated to one PDP 11 and the other half were allocated to the other PDP 11. And wow. there was a booking system and you would have to basically sit in the computer lab um, so that you could kick someone off when um, when they'd been on long enough that you could get on. And um, oh. it did become that kind of a, your whole life had to be about computer science. Um, yeah. And I think that may have turned off a bunch of women. So one of the other women went to psychology. I don't actually remember what the other one did. But when she went to psychology, I think she kind of went with this idea of this is manageable. I know what I'm getting into. I know I can. Because even, you know, in your early 20s, you're already thinking about what your, what the shape oh. of your life. Yeah. And how you'll make this fit in with uh, other things that you want to do with your life. And um, and I think I've noticed that uh, with the difference at that point anyway between men and women were that men would have that realisation like five years down the track when they're actually looking at, you know, do I want to have a family? Do I want to, where do I want to live? Do I want to move around? 
Whereas I think women were already thinking about that when they were at university, partly because that was, you know, that was the normal thing. It wasn't, it wasn't abnormal for women to go to university, but it also still wasn't the kind of, like, of course, every woman's going to try to go to university. So I think we were kind of more socialised at that point into thinking that you have to think about this long term thing and will this fit in with your career plans? Um, so I think, yeah, that that happened. Um, I mean, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. And, and it was this kind of um, like staying up all night to to get a, a program <laughs> finished and an assignment finished, that kind of thing. And that was, that was fun. But I think uh, in the end, a, a lot of the people in my cohort figured that that was not a long-term viable um, career for them. I think that's probably still a problem for a lot of women. I think it is. Um, like a lot of those sorts of thoughts will be the kinds of ones that we still have. And I was also saying to you, like, even when I first started my computer science degree in the late 90s, um, it, you know, it was still, you know, larger cohort, so about 450, but still, you know, I suppose wouldn't have been that many more female students than in your cohort, cohort of 150. Mm. But, you know, that's, that's changing now and you yeah. know, the numbers are going up, but it clearly based on the statistics, it's not, we're not keeping those numbers. They're drifting away as you, as with your friends. So yeah. clearly we're still having to face the same sort of issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, where did you see yourself uh, after you graduated with a computer science degree back then? Maybe that was one of my problems that I don't think I did. I don't know that I really knew what a career in computer science was at that stage. Um, I, I, at that stage, I had met the grand total of one computer scientist, and um, he was a neighbour who worked for the egg marketing board and had done his degree in philosophy. And so, I didn't really have a kind of a role model of what somebody in computing looked like so I, I guess I didn't is the answer yeah oh wow okay so afterwards uh like did you get a better idea as you were going through a degree sort of what's what you wanted to do with it at all like you know independent of what positions there were available yeah I did um and what I I guess what struck me um and I guess this is again remembering this was the early 80s uh was that there weren't a, there were jobs in computing, but there weren't a lot of interesting jobs in computing. And the people I was hanging out with, a lot of them were the kind of people who kind of pulled all nighters, and this was their life. And they were they ate, thought, and breathed <laughs> you know, programming. Yeah. And I guess uh, as time went on, it occurred to me that that wasn't me. I had a kind of a there was a wider range of things I wanted to do. And so, in fact, by the time I graduated, I knew I didn't want to work in the industry. So afterwards, um, you said you'd done a little bit of, uh, uh, well, field-related work um, with technical writing. So yeah, why did you choose to get into technical writing at the time? So, so I'd actually resisted doing technical writing for, for quite a long time because I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to write fiction. And uh, I didn't want to end up with that kind of writing burnout where you write all day and then you come home and you have to write at night. So I worked in other areas. Um, and then uh, it was, I guess, an opportunistic thing that I had people I knew needed things written and they were having trouble finding people who could both understand the technical stuff and also some, produce something that was readable to a user. Um, and at that time I had little kids and I was looking for part-time work that uh, I could fit into other things. So it, I, I, I really enjoy it. I, I enjoyed it, I have to say, but it was not something that I kind of sought out. It was something that came up that, that I could do. And there weren't that many people at that time, I think, who were doing it um, on that level. Right. So when did you determine that you wanted to be a writer instead? I think I'd always wanted to be a writer, but I thought that I needed to have a career to go along with it at the same time. Uh, so when I was at university, I was both studying English literature and computer science at the same time. Um, and uh, my degree was in computer science, but I'd done enough subjects that I almost had a major in English literature at the same time. Nice. So it was like the, the English lit side went out when I finally graduated. <laughs> Excellent. So how did you make that transition from, um, I guess, regular work to becoming a writer? So I, I was I was working part time a lot when my kids were little, uh, and I had a lot of time um, 
you know, taking them to swimming classes and play groups and things like that. And I would write during those, like if, if they had a swimming class, that gave me an hour of writing time that I could sit by the side of the pool and, and write. Um, I think I'd had, I'd had ideas in my head that I wanted to, I'd been writing all along, um, basically in my spare time. And then I had this kind of one idea that I wanted to write and I kind of sat down and focused on that. But it was very much in the in between times, between all the other things I was doing. So how, how do you turn writing into you know, a job, into a career? Luck, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I was incredibly lucky. Um, persistence and luck. And I had, I had written one novel that I couldn't get published, um, but I'd had a lot of really positive feedback. Uh, and, and not just, um, there were feedback that wasn't uh, boilerplate feedback. So they specifically referenced things in the book that they liked. And so that made me feel like, well, I can't just give up at one. I've got to go for another one. And I worked on that for probably about five years or so and uh, sent it out to everybody I could think of. And it, literally the last person who hadn't responded uh, came back and wanted to publish it, which was, you know, it was just lucky. I was picked up off a slush pile, which um, almost never happens. You know, it's one of those things that people say, don't expect this to happen to you because <laughs> it won't. Um, but for me, it did. It was a very, she was a very small publisher and a very new publisher. Um and I was lucky enough that uh, she decided to publish me. And then I was lucky enough that an American agent happened to be in town the same week that um, that the book was coming out. And so he happened oh, wow. to see it in a bookstore and he uh, found an American publisher for, for me. And so that was what led me to in a position where I felt like I could say, this is, this is what I'm doing now. I'm writing full time. Oh, that's brilliant. And, uh, and you just released the paperback version of Before This Is Over just this June. Yes, in America. Yeah, it's been out in Australia for quite a while, but in America it came out in June. Yeah. Oh, wow. So why would you re-release a book? So it's been out in hardback in America for um, about three years. Uh, and the paperback was because um, I, I think kind of the publishers looked and went, oh, hang on. This is what this is we're timely. going through. <laughs> yeah, this is very timely. Uh, and so it was a good time to re re-release it in paperback okay this is starting to get into other questions about the publishing but in australia it's released under an ordinary epidemic yep. what reasons do publishers have for releasing books under different titles I, I think a lot of it is actually marketing what they think is going to sell in their um in their particular uh territory um so they they weren't that keen on the ordinary epidemic title, um, which was in fact not my original title. That was a title that was chosen you know, in collaboration with the publisher here. So I wasn't particularly, it didn't worry me that they wanted to change it. Uh, but again, you know, I had input into what that title became. And I think it just comes down to marketing because, there, you know, you have a new cover, you have a new title. They know what's going to appeal to their readers. So it's a matter of positioning it so that that happens. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. Like, I would have thought... Yeah. Um... In in other circumstances, people would usually keep the same name for market penetration, but I guess it doesn't really affect, it, have that same effect. It happens a lot, and I think it happens particularly, my guess is, in the American market. Um, so, I mean, you look at things like the Harry Potter books. The original yeah. Harry Potter book had a different title in America than it did in the UK just because they didn't think people would be familiar with the Philosopher's Stone. So I, I think it's... Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It's like yeah. different things work in different <laughs> territories. Yeah, it's interesting. And so back to the book. Um, you you based that story on the experience that you had when you were living in Canada. Is that right? Yeah, I was living in Canada in um, uh, what would have been 2003 when uh, the first so SARS-1 um, outbreak happened in Toronto and I was living in Ottawa, which is about – I don't know I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's about two to three hours drive distance. So it's not that far away. And there's a lot of travel backwards and forwards. And um, and I guess I just started thinking about, you know, what would be what would this be like? What would it be like if it came to my town? How would I cope? What would I do? You know, what would a family do? Uh, particularly since I, we heard nothing else on the news for about three months, every yeah. unexplained death. Yeah, every somebody who had a slightly unusual symptoms, it's like it's here. It's arrived in Ottawa. 
Uh, it never did, but that was the feeling. Mm. And a lot of the incidents in the book I've taken pretty much directly from what happened in um, in Toronto. So uh, there were whole apartment buildings. I mean, now this seems kind of like, well, yeah, of course. But at the time, it was kind of quite shocking that they would put an entire uh, apartment building in lockdown. Um, and And within that apartment building, people kept getting sick and they couldn't come up with a reason why they were getting sick. And finally, they decided that it was moving through the sewerage system, which I think up until then had been an unheard of method of transmission. Um, so much so that I, I, when I was writing the book, I, I have a friend who um, is an infectious diseases expert, although I didn't realise that when I consulted her. <laughs> um, and she kind of looked at that and went, oh, that wouldn't happen. Um, and then came back to me about a week later and went, no, I, I went and looked it up. You're right, it did happen. Uh, because SARS, you know, the first SARS did things that people didn't expect, just like this one is. Having been through that near experience in Canada and now living this kind of experience now, has that changed the way that you've thought about your writing and how you perceive what you've written? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I still think what, one of the things when I was writing the book was that I wanted to, having a kind of a, a sciencey background, I wanted, even though the book is not about the science, I wanted the science to be real. I wanted to, so I took a real flu outbreak and I kind of inflated the numbers so that I would get a real curve. Um, and I wanted the, the symptoms to be real and have real consequences. Um, so I did a lot of research on that. I also did a lot of research on the way people behave in epidemics and you don't have to look that far, you know, there's plenty of stuff about the black plague. There's plenty of stuff about the 1918 flu. And, um, and I guess, uh, I was kind of, you know, when this first started, it was kind of this weird feeling because it was a bit terrifying because I had an idea of where these things go. And it seemed to me that we were missing opportunity after opportunity to stop this, you know, which is in fact what happens in the book too. There's like <laughs> opportunities where things to be stopped. Because we have for decades kind of gone, every time there's a like a, a, a flu scare, there's this like, oh, scientists, they're just, they're just kind of getting all panicky again. It'll be fine. It always is every time. And so I wanted to kind of, take that where the, the one time, this is the time when it happens because eventually it is going to happen. So there was this kind of weird thing when, when this pandemic started of like, I'm really uncomfortable about this because I, I have an idea where this might be going. Yeah. But also this other kind of rational part of my brain that's just sitting there and going, oh, look, I got that right. <laughs> it happened just, oh, that's slightly different from what I expected. It's like, oh, toilet paper, I didn't see that coming. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so it was this thing kind of, it was quite, I mean, heartening is not the right word, but I was kind of a bit satisfied that I hadn't got it completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not satisfied that it happened, though. I would really rather yeah, it happened. Yes, of course. It's like, yeah. I'm glad I wrote it, but damn it, I wish it wasn't so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like that, yeah. 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 Oh. Uh, unfortunately, it's not accurate in some things because uh, I had the pandemic ending in seven weeks and... Yeah, that hasn't happened. Oh, that was, <laughs> was a little bit optimistic. <laughs> well, I, I knew at the time it wasn't going to happen because you don't get a vaccine in seven weeks and that's the only way that this kind of a, a disease stops. Yeah, definitely. Because I'd had a look at the reviews that um, you had on Goodreads and a lot of them were dated before. I was wondering, like, I wonder if how many of these people are going to be revisiting the book now, whether things are framed differently now that they're seeing it from different eyes. And there was one review that was written, I think, in August of last year, uh, just remarking about um, how fantastical it might be. It's like, oh, wait three months. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a few in there that are like, well, this is completely unrealistic. And I, to, <laughs> and I do want to go back and kind of reply to them and go, it's like, what do you think Would you now? like to revisit your comment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, just yeah. yeah, just changing the perspective based on all of these experiences that we're having now. It's just very interesting. Yeah. Well, getting back to your technical roots, you didn't entirely leave the comp site behind because you also spent some time volunteering with First Robotics Australia. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still doing that. Um, I've been volunteering on and off uh, since about 
oh, I guess for about seven or eight years, um, I guess. And, uh, yeah, no, I really in, enjoy that. I think that's an incredible um, program, the FIRST Robotics program. Yeah, so how did you get involved with FIRST Robotics? Uh, through through my son. In fact, through my niece. Um, my niece was advertised on Facebook, uh, a group that was starting up locally to me, and she thought it was a would be a terrific thing for um, her brother and, and my son to do together because uh, they're about the same age. And uh, through that, uh, my partner and I started volunteering to mentor that team. And then um, once the first crop of kids were old enough, they took on the mentoring roles and we've kind of stepped back and, and done more just with the competitions and, and, and volunteering for that. Okay. So uh, what's, what's involved in the kind of work that you do as a volunteer? When we were mentoring, it was um, a matter of uh, basically herding cats, um, that you'd have these, this kind of group of teenagers and uh, we tried as much as possible to stay in the background and not, um, not kind of walk them through every step. Um, but it's just it's to be there and to help them uh, with things like, you know, what's feasible um, in building a robot, um, kind of help them work through their ideas and that kind of thing. And, you know, there's a whole range of uh, skills that are involved, um, everything from writing websites and code to the actual kind of metal work to do with building the robot and the electronics and all that kind of thing. And, you know, we both had skills in some of those areas, but not all of those areas. But, you know, you work with the kids to help them um, work out how to do this stuff. And sometimes that's a matter of kind of working it out together and sometimes it's something that you know that you can help them with. Oh, that's brilliant. So what are some of the experiences that you've had like observing these massive competitions? The competitions are a lot of fun uh, and it's actually really interesting to see um, groups of kids from all across the country, in fact, across the world at the regionals. We get people from America and from Asia and, you know, all over the place. Uh, and it's, it fosters this real spirit of cooperation, which is one of the things I really love about it. They have this um, this catchphrase, which is competition, which means, yes, it's a competition, but it's actually about cooperating. And, in fact, getting the cooperation award is more important than winning in a, in a lot of ways. And to see kind of a group of kids who are working on their own robot down tools so that they can go and help this other team, which is about to go onto the field and has got some problem that they can't solve. And, like, three different teams coming together to work on this robot that they may be competing against in the next round. But that doesn't matter because it's like, it's about sharing and learning from each other and all that kind of thing. And what I really like about it, to me the most important thing about it, is so much of what kids do in school is about um, learning known things and learning how to produce the right answer. Um, even in the humanities, you know, you, you kind of ha there's a there's a, a path that you that education treads a lot of the time, whereas in um, this kind of learning experience, there isn't a right way to solve the problem that you're set at the beginning of the build season. It's about the kids finding their own way. And to me, that builds a whole range of different skills from the ones that they're learning in, in um, school. They're not necessarily better skills, but they're, they're skills that... Um, they're complementary. Yeah, they're complementary. And they're, and they're incredibly useful, I think, for later life too. Yeah, it's great that, you know, you observe them just helping the teams that you're competing against because well it's taught about you know in competition it's always you first or your team first and you know leave the others in the dust so it, it's good that the entire experience is teaching them to you know bring everyone else up with them to me that's been the most valuable thing that i've seen it's not the teams that are are well resourced and come from schools with you know already good um tech programs in them. It's to see the teams uh, where maybe the kids um, have not encountered or have not had the opportunities um, that maybe some of these other schools have had. Um, and I think I mentioned in our talk before, there was a particular team who came uh, along, a girls team from Western Sydney, and they were... Um, the first year they were incredibly enthusiastic to the point where kind of you needed earplugs 
um, <laughs> but over the but not particularly skilled because this is the first time they they competed, and um, and over the years to see that team build and to see the girls go from um, not having ever considered uh, a career in engineering to some of them going well that's what I'm going to do I'm going to be an engineer and and to know that that changes lives uh, to me that's an incredibly valuable thing but certainly it's it's heartening to see that year on year there's been a lot more girls involved in the first teams so it was a rarity in the first few teams that I went to you know there would be the first few competitions there would be a couple of teams that had maybe one goal and now it's quite common to see all goal teams or, or half and half teams and you know that to me makes a big difference yeah it does it, it makes a huge difference when you're able to interact with other people with these same interests and um, being able to see other people who might end up being your role models or at least even you know peer models so that you can you know aspire to that it's great I think that role model thing is really important. Um, I mean, that's kind of almost one of the reasons why I keep going, even though I probably don't have as much technical skills as a lot of the other people there, is that I think that it, it's useful to see women my age who are still interested in this stuff. And there, there are a few of us. There's not a lot of us there, but there are a few of us, and I think that's really important. Yeah, it definitely is very important because you can see that there are people who, <clears throat> irrespective of their professions or their current careers, it's, it's something that can touch all of us. And it can interest yeah. all of us in different ways. Yeah, and that is valued. Yeah, definitely. And you said that uh, you said that you're interested in starting up a women in first group. So there is there is a women in first group that's been going for a few yeah. years, and um, I Sorry, think the, the older first, women in first. <laughs> yeah. So there was so there wasn't so I think the first women in first morning tea had you know I don't know ten to twenty people at it, and now kind of there's hundreds, and it's. And it's lovely. But I actually think there should be an old women at first. <laughs> I, think, I think we need to be visible, us, us old ladies. I actually think that's a, a really important thing. Yeah. That it's not just – I think you need to see that there's that longevity, that there's – you know, that I think, you know, from what I gather, a lot of women drop out of tech um, a few years into their career. And I think it's useful to see that um, there are people like you who are still there even if not directly there, but, you know, still interested in that field, you know, at their end of their careers as well as the beginning. Not yeah, that there isn't a lot important. of women who are in that, but you, you get the drift. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Because, you know, you, you see you know, the common issue is not only just recruitment, but also retention. So you get a lot of people who decide that it's not for them or they start moving into other areas. Yeah. Um, but it's not always necessarily because of, desire or interest in the other areas sometimes it's opportunities or lack of or you know burnout environment yeah. like all sorts of reasons why we stay or go in this field but just wanting to being able to see what opportunities that we all have is the important thing regardless of where they end up yeah yeah no I absolutely agree with you about that yeah. so yeah I guess in the 80s because of when you were doing computer science yeah, I'm finding it hard to imagine what it would have been like having to go to uni without, you know, the internet. <laughs> no, well, we didn't even have we didn't even have email. I mean, there were bulletin boards and there was news, but um, what, so one of my friends um, who who wasn't at uh, University of New South Wales is at a different university. Uh, so we had in within the university email. Yes, um, he had managed to. Um, get himself by not necessarily totally legitimate means <laughs> access to a staff account that allowed him to email outside the university. And that was just, that was extraordinary that he could send us emails. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot that you can't, that um, the internet makes a whole lot of stuff more, more accessible because when I was trying to teach myself how to code a sprite on the, um, the Apple um, yeah. like I said, uh, there was a manual that came with it, uh, that, and that was my sum total of my, um, information that I had. There was nowhere I could go to, you know, ask somebody a question or, and I didn't know anybody else who coded and, or, or search it up or, or anything like that. Um, yeah. so you're very much more reliant on 
word of mouth and the people around you and and if you if they didn't know you didn't know basically <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely yeah yeah I mean, and now it's like well we've got just so many resources available to us it's it's insane like just being yeah. able to like everybody can code now it's, yeah. it's just so accessible yeah absolutely <laughs> have you tried yeah, anything and, like that since <laughs> um coding or, or that yep. kind of thing yeah I mean, okay, so I, when, with the first team that I mentored, we were running um, uh, robot-making workshops for um, primary school kids. It was one of the outreach that they were doing. And, I mean, I do, I have done, like, you know, I did kind of websites and, and things like that when I was doing technical writing, so I coded HTML, which is hardly difficult. And um, I would occasionally help, you know, my kids when they were doing little coding projects. but. Um, the first time I had really looked at any kind of programming was it for probably 20 years was at this workshop and a kid had a problem with their um, code and I kind of, and I was helping with something else, but it's like nobody else is available. I'll come and look at it. And he's within like three seconds, he's going, oh, well, if you don't know, I'll ask somebody who knows. And I'm like, <laughs> give me a minute. I've just got to catch up on this. <laughs> and about a minute later, I'm going, okay, I see we've gone wrong. This, this, and this. And he was like, oh, I didn't expect her to have the answer. <laughs> uh, well, clearly you don't really lose the skills. <laughs> No, I don't think you do. It just takes a while to kind of <laughs> reorient yourself again. <laughs> yes, definitely. Oh, that's hilarious. Just, yeah, getting to the point where, you know, the generation below is like, no, you don't have no idea how this works. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And for lots of things I wouldn't, but it was, I can't remember what they were coding in, but whatever it was, it was pretty simple. And yeah. Yep. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we might start moving on to some of the other questions that I mentioned I might have for you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what sort of hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to your now field of work? I guess writing would be that now. So I've been thinking about this. and I've got way too many hobbies. Um, <laughs> but the hobby, I mean, it kind of is related, but not less related than you think. So I, I do book binding. So <laughs> I like rebinding old books. And give them kind of new um, yeah. covers and things like that, which I learned from an amazing woman um, who's an artist uh, who's been um, who taught herself bookbinding basically, and she ran classes and just kind of as a whim I took it. It was like the most amazing thing. I just absolutely loved it. So I've I've um, I've um, bound my my son uh, finished his PhD last year, and I've bound his mm -hmm. thesis. So he has a beautifully bound oh, thesis that's and. Beautiful. Yeah, and I've got another couple of relatives who are doing theses this year, so that's my project for this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. So what, what interested you to start doing the bookbinding? I, I really love books, um, which is kind of weird because I, I don't actually read paper books anymore. I read them <laughs> still. Um, yeah. I have a whole lot of them, but I don't read them. <laughs> and these yeah. are the ones that I used to read when I had to read on paper. But I really love them as objects, um, and to me they're – so which one of the reasons I really like um, binding old books is because there are often books that mean something to someone. Mm. They're books that I've had since I was a kid and they've fallen apart because I've read them so often. Um, or that, you know, had it have um, some kind of emotional resonance for someone. Um, and I think I find that, <laughs> it sounds really weird, but I find the dichotomy between the, effectively the software and the hardware of a book, really interesting, that yeah. uh, the words don't have to be on paper. The words can be spoken. The words can be on something electronic. Um, so the words are not kind of integral to the object, but the yeah. object itself is still beautiful and holds a whole lot of meaning, yes. um, if that makes sense. <laughs> that makes perfect sense because it's, it's, it's what you interact with. So yes. you might see the words, but you're touching the book and it's the – the actual tactile experience of, you know, having the book and reading the book. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So I kind of, I value the words. Like I said, I, I'm quite happy to read on a Kindle because it's when I'm reading, I'm not really aware of what I'm reading on. It's, it's the words and it's the, in my head and, and the words are in my head, not on the page. Yes. But also the book has the memories of having 
read it yes. and who I was when I read it and where I was and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Makes you wonder, well, are you going to have those same sorts of um, recollections and um, experiences from reading an ebook? Like, are you going to remember this is what you were reading and who you're reading? <laughs> I wonder. I mean, I wonder because, you know, the, you, you go back through an old book and you'll find, I mean, again, this wouldn't happen now anyway, but, you know, I found yeah. bus tickets from, yes. um, you know, that I was using as a bookmark and I could go, yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to that place. I must have been, you know, the only reason I ever went to that place was to visit this person. So, you know, yeah, sometime when I was reading this book, I was visiting this person. So, yeah, yeah there are all those kind of lovely things about it. And and I've always thought the books are for um for using. And my dad was wouldn't be horrified with this because he was he was like books must be kept pristine. But so my <laughs> books are always dog eared and they've got notes written in the margins and that kind of thing. And you can't yeah. do that with a Kindle, obviously. No, but the it's notes, not the same. It's not the same. Yeah. No, it's not. And you're not going to get those recollections like so, oh this is you know, I wrote this here because of this thing or no, oh, my handwriting's changed a bit since. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, it's all it's all very tactile. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Continuing on, which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? Um, again, there's there's a couple, uh, but the one that I think is um, th which ties back in with the bookbinding because it was the first book that I rebound when I was learning to bookbind is yeah. a book called The Phantom Tollbooth by a guy called um, oh my mind has gone blank Norton Juster. Yeah. Uh, and I think my mum picked it up in a secondhand bookstore. It was already old when I got it. And it's about a boy called Milo who is bored and has nothing to do. And um, and a mysterious package arrives which has a toll booth that takes him through to another world. And it's just full of these beautiful puns and um, and kind of looking at words in different ways. And um, But also there's this tension in the book between um, these two kingdoms which are Dictionopolis and Digitopolis. <laughs> which is the world of uh, you know, the kingdom of numbers and the kingdom of, of words. Yeah. And I think even when I was little, that really appealed to me. Um, and I read that till it fell apart. And then I read it to my kids in pieces. So yeah. that when I had, was looking for a, a, a project to do to bind, it was like that. I want that to that, be whole that's, again. That's the perfect one. So, yeah, oh, absolutely. Just, and just being able to give it new life because it, you, you fear it was shared with your kids as well. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And so it's, it, yeah, it's, it'll, it'll last for another 40 years now. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. It's funny that you mentioned the Phantom Tollworth because another one of my guests, um, Associate Professor Rhea Lang, actually, uh, Rhea Liang, sorry, pronunciation, um, she also said that it was her most memorable oh, right. book. And she also reads it to her kids or read it to her kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's it's so many kind of catchphrases out of that book that we use all the time, you know, jumping to conclusions and, and things like that, that are kind of actual events in the book that you get, you jump to wow. conclusions and you end up on this island of conclusions. Oh, um, that's, that's a brilliant and, way of being able to illustrate all these idioms. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it was a really beautiful book. And I think it's, it's so imaginative and um, it, it kind of lets you, like it brings all these things to you, but then lets you kind of embellish on them and think on them. And, and, and I think with kids, it really appeals to them. It did yeah. to me, I think it did to my kids too. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, I guess because you've been a mentor, this probably lends itself to this. What sort of advice would you give to someone who would like to do what you do, either having been through computer science with your mentoring or uh, becoming a writer? And what advice should they ignore? So, the advice if you want to be a writer, um, I think the only advice I can really give is that you have to do it because you want to do it and you don't care whether you ever see it in print or not. Um, seeing it in print is fantastic and, you know, and, I, and there are a lot of people who make careers out of it and, um, and are very driven to do that. But I think the first impulse has to come from the, the, the chances of succeeding are so small and so much of it is luck and so much of it is timing and you just happen to be the right story at the right time. You know, like I said, 
a couple of months publication either way and this agent in America wouldn't have seen it. Um, yeah. if, if I'd been pitching the book a year earlier, the publisher who finally published it wouldn't have started up yet. So I think it's going to be one of those things that it's all about persistence and it's about luck and you have to do it because you want to do it, not because you think that will be a great career. Um, as to mentoring, I think it's everybody's got something to offer and even if you don't think that um, you think, oh, look, there'll be people with more skills than I have or, or um, this isn't really my field. I, th I think everybody's got something to offer. And often what you've got to offer is um, either skills that these kids don't have or a different perspective. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I had a certain amount of technical skills, both in building and coding and that kind of thing that I could offer. And I knew a little bit about engineering principles and all that kind of thing. But I also knew a lot about writing and communication. And so I could offer that to the kids. I could give them a different perspective on um, on how to go about things. Um, yeah. I think that it's, in both of them, it's basically just show up and do it. Um, yeah. That's the only way forward. You know, so many times when I finished um, my first book, people would say, oh, I started writing a book once. I don't know how you do it. I, I kind of did it for about a month and then I stopped. And I think the answer to that is everybody does it for a month and then stops. But whether you finish depends on whether you start again. Yeah. And it's just kind of keeping on going back to it and um, not being dissuaded. Yeah. So how, because like it, it's good to have that mindset of not expecting success to be your final outcome but even if you're doing it for the passion for the love of doing it like how do you stay motivated to continue how do you pick up again once you've bailed out after that month um I don't know you just do <laughs> <laughs> uh I think to a certain extent it's one of those things that um Look, life will always get in the way and there'll be times when you can't do it. But uh, it, if you really want to do it, it niggles in your mind. It's one of those things like, you know, so I am I also do knitting and there's no point that I put down a project and go, oh, well, I put down that project that's never going to work. There's a, there's a point where I go, I mean, sometimes, obviously, and sometimes you <laughs> pull the ball out and start again. But But you might put it aside for a while, but there's always something inside you that goes, I want to do this. I have to go back to it. Um, I think, I think the other thing, so the other thing to do particularly now, and I think again, the internet's made a big difference to this is, so when my first book didn't get published, um, I was quite, you know, downhearted about that and yeah. I was quite discouraged. Uh, and when I realized that it was never going to happen, it was never going to get published. I, I put it up on Kindle. Um, yeah. I effectively self-published it and, and you can get feedback and you can, and there's a lot of writers who have built followings that way through mm. sites like Goodreads and, and putting their stuff up on Kindle. Um, and so there is like now there's ways to get feedback that mm. weren't really available pre-internet. Um, and I think that's kind of the way to do it is to, is to be prepared to go out there and, um, put your stuff out there. And even if only a handful of people read it, you know, that was one of the most exciting things that happened to me was I put up um, giveaway copies on uh, Goodreads of my first book. Yeah. And to have people I didn't know read it and give reviews and and to have people get something that I'd written and to kind of comment on, the, the title was a pun. And after about a year and a half, somebody went, oh, the title means that. And it was like, <laughs> somebody got it. Somebody got it. <laughs> it was, it was like, like, so that's motivating. That keeps you going. And it doesn't need a lot of people. It can be 10 or 15 people. It can be enough to keep you motivated. Yeah, that's great. Like, <laughs> it is playing the long game, though, because like, I don't know how long it's going to take before I get that payoff. <laughs> yes. No, and you, and you don't. Um, there's a writer called um, Hugh Howie who wrote a book called Wool, which was very successful a few years ago. Um, and he describes it as his hobby, which just happens to make him money. Um, but he's, he, talk, he writes a lot about the long game and working for the long game. And I don't think in writing there is any other game. I, I don't think there's anyone 
who is an overnight success. Um, for starters, just to write a book is going to take you, it's not going to be days. <laughs> it's going to be, yes. you know, months or more likely years. And so you have to be in for the long haul. Um, yeah, otherwise it's just not going to work. <laughs> yeah, just being able to get your mindset in the right place to be able to, you know, keep going and do all those things. It's great. It's, it's, that's, I think, the hardest thing is to, and to not beat yourself up when you, when a book doesn't succeed or a story doesn't succeed or, or you look and realise that you haven't actually touched your project for two months. You know, you, like every day is, is the day that I start again rather than the day that I didn't do it for two months. And that's the only way you can look at it. Otherwise, you just get too discouraged. Yeah, of course, definitely. Yeah. Good things to keep in mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, thank you so much for speaking to me today about your life and your writing. It's been very interesting, very educational, enlightening. <laughs> um, so if people would like to reach out to you or to learn more about your books, where can they find out more? So I have a website, amandahickey.com. It's um, A-M-A-N-D-A-H-I-C-K-I-E.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook at Amanda Hickey Author, spelled the same way. Okay, great. can include those links in the show notes. Okay. And, yeah, okay. so thank you so much. It's been amazing speaking today. Thank you so much for having me. It was lots of fun. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed hearing about Amanda's experience of studying computer science in the 80s, as well as her time volunteering with Best Robotics. It's also been fascinating learning about Amanda's experience as a writer and the publishing process. Even if you're not a writer, her advice about mindset and perseverance can speak to all of us, no matter what kind of creator or tinkerer you are. To learn more about Amanda and what we discuss on this show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steam Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also reach out to Amanda at her website, amandahickey.com, and Facebook, the links for which will be in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky and geek curious friends. You can also support Steam Powered on Patreon and Ko-fi under Steam Powered Show, the links for which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for watching! <laughs>